Good morning. Good to be back. Preach to people. It's been 15 weeks of online, and at least now I know there are people listening, right? People tuning in. I want to say hi to everybody on YouTube or Facebook, wherever you may be viewing. Um, Neighboring is getting hard in 2020. Would you guys agree? First, we get hit with the coronavirus, which allows us to be uh, physically apart from those that we enjoy the company of, or family, or friends, and maybe in some of those who we don't. But uh, And then now we have some of those people in our groups of friends and people that we love and family members that we're now seeing division because of you're either on the left or the right. I understand not everybody can be centered on the cross's eye. But we have these disagreements, these different opinions, and neighboring has been hard and I've gone to God in in this season and I've said, God, what is it that you would have me do? How can I show your love in this time? Do you want me to speak on the matter at hand? Do you want me to give my opinion? The people need to know how I feel. I have a platform here. I have to I have to let the students know what the truth is. And 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 God says, No, you don't need to say anything. I didn't anoint you for that. But what I do need you to do is check your heart. Has anybody ever had that phrase or sentence that somebody, maybe a teacher or a parent or somebody growing up said that just sticks with you? Well, I had a pastor when I'd be fooling off a lot of the times, he'd always just look at me straight with this face and say, check your heart, right? And now, almost 15 years later, he's still right about here, just on my shoulder, just, he has no body, just a head. And he's just making that face. He doesn't even have to say anything. And I say, man, check my heart. So that's the journey that God had brought me through right now. And he said to check your heart. Does anybody believe that you're a good person in here? You've kind of done the self-evaluation. Like, hey, like, I'm not racist. I don't, like, hate anybody. And, like, I think I'm a pretty good person. Then do this very dangerous thing. And today, ask God to search your heart. I ask God to search my heart. I've been serving communities where I live for 15 years. I want to say that I love everybody, but the truth of the matter is that that's not true. That I don't love everybody. As much as I want to say it and make you guys think that I do, it's not. That there are prejudices in my heart. That it may not be black or white. It may not be left or right. But there are certain people groups that I'm not fond of. There are certain groups of people or beliefs out there that I am against. There are certain times that I have an agenda. And when God searched my heart and revealed these things to me, that I was walking around thinking that we're okay. We're things that, well, God's not bothering me about them, so I'm just going to leave them. No, God revealed to me the wrongs in my heart. He revealed to me the different compartments that I place people in, the different ways that I treat other people, the ways that I judge and think of other people. If we're all honest right here, right now, you judged me when I got hired on here, right? Don't lie. It's okay. I judged you too. (laughs) Mostly your fashion sense, but it is what it is. All right. So, so what I want to do today is only share my convictions with you. I don't want to share my thoughts or my opinions or or my side. I just want to give you the word of God and do what you will with it in hopes that the word of God convicts you just like it did me and brings me to a place of much more peace, a different perspective on what's going on. Amen. Pray with me if you would. Lord, thank you so much for this time. Thank you for the truth of your word, Lord. Thank you for using me as a a vessel to communicate this word, God. I ask right now that I would decrease in this moment and that you would increase, Lord. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. The title of the message this morning is Confronting Our Hearts and Examining Our Behavior. Confronting Our Hearts and Examining Our Behavior. Sounds simple. It sucks. All right. The Bible tells us that all sin begins in the heart. We look in the book of Mark, Mark chapter 7, verses 21 through 23 say this, For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. 
All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. Now, the scriptures use various aspects to describe a human anatomy, and the, the, the different, different parts of the human anatomy to, 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 <laughs> uh, to describe a human. But the most that we see right now is the heart. We see that the heart is used the most, and often the heart refers to the soul of a human being. It refers to that which it controls the mind, the will, and the emotions of somebody. The heart is the seat of mind and emotion. The seat of mind and emotion. Your intelligence, your thoughts, your morality, your human choice, and even one's religion. The heart is the inner man or the inner woman. The whole person in all of his or her distinctive activity. Everything that you do, you think, and you will toward. Thinking, planning, worshiping, feeling, loving, social interacting. Now Jeremiah 17.9 says this. It says that the human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? So me without Jesus is no good, right? We got that? So your heart, you know how people say, oh, follow your heart. Yeah, don't do that. The Bible tells us don't do that. Heart is bad, right? So Jeremiah called the heart deceitful above all things. Other translations and various different Bibles will tell you this. It will say that exceedingly corrupt is the heart that it is desperately sick that it is dreadfully wicked that it is beyond cure all of which refers to man's depth of moral depravity under the influence of an evil heart everything can appear in false colors Maybe you've known somebody who, who their reality is not the actual reality. A lot of times I've worked with addicts who the reality that they're living in is not the real reality that all of us are living in. And that's what can, can, can come over us with an evil heart. When our heart is not right, we can see things and they will appear in false colors. People don't follow your heart. Okay? No matter what somebody tells you, if a counselor tells you, oh, just follow your heart, go with what's up, do not follow your heart. While we can be deceived by our own self delusions, God knows our deepest and innermost thoughts and motives. Jeremiah, keep continuing on to verse 10, says this But I, the Lord, search all hearts and examine secret motives. I give all people their due rewards according to what their actions deserve. You or I do not get to decide what I deserve or what you deserve. We do not see every aspect of my life. You do not see every action, every thought, every manipulation, every wrongdoing, everything that I say to tear somebody else down. Therefore, you do not get to decide what I deserve and what I don't deserve. Only God gets to decide that. 1 Samuel 16, 7 says this, Do not look at his appearance or at height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For God sees not as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. We live in this social media world where I can put this perception of who I want you to think that I am. Where I can post pictures and say things and have other people say things that gives you a depiction of something false, right? God knows it all. He knows every single thing. The heart represents the total response of a person's life around them. Every single thing, not just what you see and not just what I see. Therefore, we cannot be the judge. Therefore, we cannot be the one who decides how somebody should be treated, what benefits they get or do not get. Only God. What comes out of us is indicative to what is inside of us. What comes out of us is indicative to what is inside of us. What's stored up inside is eventually going to bubble out when pressure is put on us, right? When pressure is applied, whatever's in there is going to end up coming out. The thing that you didn't want to come out, the thing that you haven't said for a long time, but you've been thinking it. We, we have these two buckets, these two eternal buckets in our life, right? 
and we put all the good stuff in here and all the positive stuff, and then we put all the things that our heart wants and our flesh is after. So over here, you might have drug abuse, you might have adultery, you might have pornography, you might have the, some evil things that you've seen or you've witnessed or you've experienced with people. And then over here, maybe you go to youth group and you go to church and you listen to these podcasts and you read this. Well, everything that you're taking in is going to come out one way or another and you can only grab from these buckets to take out of right so watch what you allow your kids to be a part of be careful with what you expose yourself and others to because that is what's going to come out oh i'm not racist i'm not a mean person i'm not this way i'm not that way and i was taught to be this way but i changed my ways be careful what you're exposing yourself to what you're teaching others and what you're t what you're exposing others to in your life out of the abundance the word says out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks whatever you're putting in there the most the mouth is going to speak right so I want to refer the story of the Good Samaritan right now. Story of the Good Samaritan, Pastor Steve communicated that story very well a few weeks ago, but I want to look at it a little bit differently. There was an expert in the law, and he asked Jesus, how do I inherit eternal life? And Jesus asked the expert, saying, well, you are an expert, so how do you read it? And he says, well, to love God with all of your heart, all of your soul, and all of your mind, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And then the man asked Jesus, he says, who is my neighbor? At that point, Jesus told a parable. And we are so far removed from this time and this culture, it can be hard for us to see just how incredibly politically, religiously, and racially charged this story was. Jesus here, he pushes all the buttons, right? Verse 30, it says this. It says, in reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road. And when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. These were religious leaders. They knew the law. They knew their responsibility. They knew they were supposed to help somebody in need, but they didn't. The scripture says that they saw him. So they seen the need. This is, this is referencing, if it was in our church today, it would say Pastor Jason and Pastor Steve walked right by them. That these people who had the responsibility who God had called to help individuals like this, they walked by and they saw him. Maybe they, they had to have had some type of excuses. Maybe they thought it was a trap and they were going to get robbed. But either way, they had to justify within themselves why they did not do that. And I think that there's only one way to justify that. And it was their heart was not right. That their heart was evil. That they seen a need and did not feel the need because they did not like or disagree. Or that person wasn't on the same team. That person was an outcast to, to their group of people. They didn't like him. Whatever the reason was, his heart was not right. And loving others as yourself can be really hard. Loving others as yourself can be really hard because sometimes we have a hard time loving ourselves. We have a hard time believing what it is that God said about us, but it's easy to hear what Rebecca said about me and believe that. But not the creator of the world. And when we have a hard time loving ourselves, we have an even harder time loving others, right? How can I love others well if I can't love myself well? Well, often the struggle with our relationship with God's love is trying to earn it versus embracing it. So often I'll see somebody get angry at somebody who's got sin going on in their life and they know it and they're filled with joy because this other person is over there angry because they haven't done enough works yet that they feel that they should be with the joy of the Lord and in the presence of God at that time. It's the difference between thinking that you have earned it and they have not 
and embracing what God said. Again, we are trying to add to what God said, to add what we think, to add what we believe. But religion always attaches a work-based relationship to God, while relationship attaches a love-based approach to God. So if you're viewing yourself one way, you are automatically going to put that on others. If you feel that you do not deserve this, or you feel that you're in this socioeconomic level and that you cannot get out of that, or, or you feel that, that, that this is where, where God has to have this person and you don't, you don't get to choose, no. That's not how it works out. We cannot put on how we feel about ourselves to others, but we do. So we have to begin to believe that what God said about me is true. And the same thing that God said about me is the same thing that God said about him and her and you and me. Amen? You guys following me? You convicted? I hope so. I did. I had to cry over this. Come on now. I want to see some tears or something. So we love God. And we love ourselves and we love others through his love for us. What does that mean? It means that when the revelation of love is embraced, it means that you can't really love others until you know what love is. So I understand it when I see people who can't love themselves. How can we expect them to love another person? When the revelation of his love is embraced, we respond to it by surrendering our hearts to him. Isn't that just what happens automatically? 1 John 4.19 says that we love him because he first loved us. We wouldn't love God if we never felt his love for us. Right? I don't expect somebody who doesn't know God to love God. I don't expect somebody who has never had a relationship with God to love God. I work with students. Majority of my students do not know God. They're taught to love God, but they've never actually loved God. And if they get out of youth group, they're going to go to college thinking that they love God because they were taught to love God, but never actually ended up loving God. Therefore, it's hard for them to love themselves and somebody else. We always have to check our heart. It's always going to come down to us. God is always going to point at you. All right. Back to the story of the Samaritan. Verse 33 starts off and it says this, but a Samaritan. The but is a big deal here. It let them know that the next person Jesus was going to mention was the hero of the story. It said, but, and that's a big deal here. It's shocking. It's outrageous. It means that somebody that these guys disagree with, that isn't a part of their crew, that has different beliefs, that has a different way of living, is now going to be the hero. Our enemy is about to be the hero in our story. What, what do you mean? Well, let me tell you, this is how God works. To the Jews, Samaritans, they were half-breeds. They were traitors. They were religiously offensive. If they were going to travel, they would actually go around their territory so that they would not have to breathe Samaritan air and touch Samaritan dust. Do we ever avoid certain people groups or neighborhoods? Hello, just me? I've seen some of y'all lock in your cars when I walked by, so I... <laughs> verse 33 but a Samaritan as he traveled came where the man was and when he saw him so he saw him too but something's different happened here when he saw him he took pity on him he went to him and bandaged his wounds pouring on oil and wine then he put the man on his own donkey brought him to an inn and took care of him the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper look after him he said and when I return I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. We can put any name that you dislike, that you don't agree with at the end of that, and it could still be God's plan for your life. But then Colin Kaepernick comes along and he helps and he does whatever it costs. He doesn't care about the blood in his car or the gas money that it's going to take to get to the hospital. He just does it because it needs to get done. Well, I don't agree with that guy, Colin Kaepernick, or what he stands for or anything, but could God still use him? 
When you said no, could God still use the person you disagree with because they'll say yes? Let's spread that feeling around a little bit. But then President Trump came along, and he was the hero. But then an Islamic leader came along, and they were a hero. But then Barack Obama came along, and he was a hero. But then a homosexual. But then Carol Baskins. But then a minority. But then Antifa. But then Black Lives Matter. And even, yes, even me or you. God is not a respecter of persons. What do all of these people that I just mentioned have in common? At the mention of their name, people have a reaction because of how they feel about that person, what they stand for, what they've done, or what they've said. Now, it's not a perfect illustration, but maybe one of these names I said has triggered you in a way so that you can catch a glimpse of just what the Jewish audience would have felt hearing that somebody from the other team was about to be the hero. It was political, it was racist, and it was religious. The Samaritan, the one who we view, think of that person in your head, whoever you're like, oh, that guy's a piece of work, right? God bless him. The Samaritan went way beyond the minimum. They risked their own safety, becoming religiously unclean. They took on tremendous financial sacrifice. He literally did anything he could. Do you see the struggle with whom Jesus made the hero? Do you know that feeling of having to say something good about somebody who you really don't want to? Our inclination is always to look out for ourselves? How is this going to impact me? How is this going to impact my future, my security? Sometimes what God wants doesn't line up with my comfort. It doesn't line up with my political views or my opinions. It does not, it does not line up with what I think or what I want or who I have voted for, what I think is right and wrong. Jesus calls us to go and do likewise. In Matthew 5, Jesus was talking about neighboring. And in verse uh, 41, he says this. He says, if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Under Roman law, a soldier could force somebody at any given time to drop what they were doing and to carry their load for one mile. It was an insult. A constant reminder that they were a conquered people by a dangerous government. And what does God call us to do in that situation? Go beyond. Do more. They asked for two. They asked for one mile. Take them two. Christ's instruction was to not only submit, but to go beyond what was required. In Matthew 25, 35 through 36 The text says this, it says, For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Notice it doesn't describe what type of person they were or how they got in that situation. It just describes the need. But Lord, forgive me because I can be so judgmental sometimes. Because even the first time when I go to look to fill a need, the first thing as I'm thinking is, how did this person get in that situation? Do I really need to give them money? If they're not great with money, they're just going to be in this situation again. How did this person get here? What bad choices did they make? No, no, it doesn't say any of that. It just says, you did it. It says, these people resemble me. And what you did unto them was as if you were to do it unto me. Church, the people that we bad, badly talk about, that we have those thoughts about, the people who we intentionally take action toward to break them down or their movement or their agenda or what they are doing, God knows exactly what you're doing. God convicted my heart and pulled things out of me that I didn't even know were there. I was walking around like they were just fine. We worry about temporary things. We worry about the economy. We worry about who can we blame for this season and what's going on. 
Are these people worth the cost? Is neighboring worth the sacrifice? But Jesus calls us to go beyond. He says, empathize with those who suffer in ways that you don't understand. We cannot have an opinion on something we don't understand, church. This is not a reality. Empathize with those who suffer in ways that we don't. We need to ask questions. How can I demonstrate Christ during this time? If people overhear my conversations, would they be pointed to God or would they be pointed away from God? Do my impassioned posts online create walls or do they create bridges? Do my words and actions send the message that I am a neighbor, I'm a person to reach out to? Or do they send the message for people to just stay away from this guy? Does the unmarried pregnant girl think that it's safer for her to go to talk to somebody at an abortion clinic? Or does she feel safe speaking to me? Do my marginalized friends feel I'm someone who can understand injustices that happen to them? Or am I unsafe because... I will be too distracted by how it impacts my politics, my income, and my comfort. What does loving God, loving our neighbors, and loving ourselves, because if we can't do that, then we can't do the other two, what does that look like? We read it earlier, 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 7. says this, I sp If I speak in tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I'm a noisy gong, a clinging, clinging symbol. So if I go out and protest, or if I say this on social media, or if I post this picture, or if I let people know how much I've done for the marginalized population, whatever I do, and I'm with it, practice your rights, protest for things, I, I get it. But if you're not doing it in love, the Bible says that you're just making noise. That you're doing nothing. So if you're doing it just because you don't like the other team, no, no, no. You have to be doing it because you want to stand for truth, and truth stands in love. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have and if I deliver up my body to be burned but have not love, I gain nothing. If you give away every cent that you have, every belonging that you own, and then give up your own body, but it's not out of love, it's nothing. Works aren't going to do it. We have to change our heart condition. You cannot work your way to love. Love starts and begins here with the power of God. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. If anything that you're doing to stand up for what you believe in, if any of those words can describe it, I like this one. It does not insist on its own way. If what you're doing and standing up for insists on only its own way, it's nothing. Stop doing it. Doesn't matter anyway. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing. It does not get excited just because your enemy was taken down a level. Or because you got into enemy territory. Or because the gossip that you spread is starting to be believed. It doesn't matter. Rejoice with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. It looks like loving the way that Christ loves them. That's my biggest problem. I want to love people how Christ loves them. I want to see people how Christ sees them. And I don't. I just don't. But guess what? I'm working on it. It means sacrifice. 
It means empathy. It means instead of outraged and being angry, how about understanding? How about we begin to learn the things that we do not understand? The young man is made for war, but the old man is made for wisdom. We have to quit criticizing and begin to counsel these young men and women who are fearlessly fighting for what they believe in. You know, if the church wasn't such a turnoff by its own people, these people would probably be having a gospel movement right now. If we do this the right way, this is not a movement against blue or red or Christian or atheist or right or left or black or white. It could be a movement of God. But it would take the elders of the church to say, I'm going to stop criticizing these young people, and I am going to begin to counsel them. I am going to begin to pour wisdom into them because they're ready. You see it, they're ready, they're fearless, they want change, you want change, but they don't know how to do it, they don't know what they're doing, and they don't know when to do it. But with the help of the saints, this could be a gospel movement, but right now it's a movement of hatred and violence. Shame on me. I should have checked my heart sooner. Sacrificing my security, my popularity, my status, my finances, and even sometimes my physical safety for the sake of others. It means being a neighbor to everyone, not just the ones that I like and want to be neighbors with. I'm going to leave you guys with this today. If you're not neighboring well, if you're not neighboring well, if you have issues in your heart with individuals in this community, in this church, who have taken up some type of space in your life, then how could you be loving God well? You can't. If you're not neighboring well, how could you be loving God? Well, the two are vitally linked, church. I want us to take some time today. And when Amanda and Michelle come up to sing, however you want to respond, allow God to move in your heart in a mighty way, in a very scary way, in a way that's going to bring you to your knees like it did me but in a way that is necessary for us to move forward, to begin to understand things that we don't understand, to begin to get a new perspective that we haven't had before, to be able to see people how God sees people. Church, if we can only be really good at just a few things in life, I think that we make one of those one that Jesus put at the top of his list. Amen? Let's be known for being people who neighbor well.